Hello, everyone. Welcome to this pa panel discussion on a very important day, the International Day for Solidarity with Palestine, uh, which is really, you know, solidarity with Palestine now is more important than ever, and it's actually an urgent action. Um, I'm Dina Matar. I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS, and I also teach in the uh, media department. Uh, I'm just going to be moderating uh, the panel because we have an uh, exceptional collection of scholars who are going to talk about uh, or around the title of Accept Palestine, uh, Solidarity, Rights, and Activism. And we're going to do this in terms of alphabetical order, uh, in terms of people's names. So, um, and then I'll just introduce uh, the speaker and their title uh, to make sure that we have enough time uh, for uh, the speakers to say what they want to say today. This is a town hall discussion, and uh, which means that uh, the interventions are interventions. They're about um, seven to ten minutes long, and so we will have plenty of time for uh, questions at the end. Um, I don't want to talk that much because, you know, my voice is going to, to be lost in a minute, but um, I want to thank everyone for coming. But uh, most importantly, importantly, thank the panelists, some of whom, like Gilbert um, Ashkar, um, arranged to come today because two of our original speakers are not well. And um, I want to just pass on to Mavish Ahmad from the LSE Human Rights uh, because this is the second series of such town hall style discussions around the idea of except Palestine, that doesn't mean that we do, um, do adopt the argument around exceptionalism, but we have to think beyond it and we have to think how to interrogate it and what does that mean. Uh, so the first event, and um, Vish will come and talk about it in a minute, um, was at the LSE on uh, the 7th of February, uh, 7th of November, and now I ask Mavish to come and uh, give us uh, a briefing on it. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Matar. I'm just going to sh share very few words uh, about Accept Palestine as a town hall series, how it started, why we felt it was necessary to emphasize, think through, and reject the exceptionalization of Palestine, and what you can, what you all can do, and possibly some of the panelists, to bring this town hall to your university to refuse the silencing, intimidation, and Orwellian framing of Palestine's ongoing Nakbas. Except Palestine was first held as a town hall event uh, featuring eight speakers, including uh, Professor Matar, Dr. Mai Taha, who's also in the audience, and myself, um, at the London School of Economics in the aftermath of a systemic campaign to try to silence and intimidate students and academics through social media pylons, articles in the right-wing press, anonymous complaints to the university, and mass reporting of anyone speaking about Palestine to police and to prevent. LSE Human Rights and Law joined forces to refuse the shutting down or attempts to shut down university spaces as sites to speak freely and openly and think together about Palestine and to express political solidarity with Palestine. The purpose of Accept Palestine was to emphasize the undeniable fact that there is both something very unique about Palestine, about the way that it's systemically excised from our classrooms, our universities, and our public debate, because it's categorically limited, labeled as criminal and terroristic politics and speech. But it was also to think that this systemic excising reflects perhaps a curious universal list uh, excising to unpack. Uh, a, it was an attempt to think with it to unpack and to chart how attempts to remove Palestine and Palestinians as a land, a people, and a politics tells us something about our shared universal condition. The particular censuring of Palestine tells us something that there is something perhaps paradigmatic about Palestine. Both the uniqueness of how Palestine is treated tells us that Palestine is a universal, uh, that tells us about all of our worlds, all of our universities, um, there, here, and everywhere else. So Professor Matar reached out um, to say that we must mark today with a similar kind of town hall. 29th November, International Day of Solidarity, declared in a UN General Assembly resolution in 77 to mark the day that the UN partitioned Palestine. Um, and we agreed uh, that except Palestine should travel from LSE 
to here to SOAS. Um, and tonight I invite all of you to take accept Palestine as a series to refuse its exception um, elsewhere maybe to UCL and Kings, now they have to do it. See, I said it out loud. Um, but uh, also elsewhere and in other universities. Um, because as I said at that event, and I'll say again, we need Palestine more than Palestine needs us because the liberation of Palestine there and here is tied to the liberation of us all. Thanks. And you will see as we go through the uh, speakers that it is a cross-university collaboration of speakers coming from UCL and from King's uh, and from Goldsmiths as well as from SOAS. So I want to invite our first panelist, uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar. Um, he's a professor of development and international relations at SOAS. And I leave him to talk. Um, I don't know what his title is, uh, as I don't know any, what anyone's title is going to be. Uh, but looking forward to reading you, Gilbert, and thank you for stepping in last minute. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Is it working? Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dina, and uh, yeah, as uh, you just heard, I'm uh, replacing at the last minute, uh, uh, well, my SOAS colleague, Nimr Sultani, who fell ill, and uh, it turns out that also another colleague couldn't be here. But the truth is, uh, Dina wanted me to be here to start with someone with SOAS because my name starts with A. <laughs> so, uh, quickly, uh, four, four points. We have a very limited time, each one. So the first I will be making is that uh, what we have been witnessing, and I would say it's the first time in history that such an event is witnessed, is broadcast daily, is a genocide. You can't think of any previous genocide having been followed day by day, hour by hour, by the media. And that is exactly what has happened under our eyes. Uh, 15,000 people killed in less than seven weeks. 40% of these are children. More children killed in those seven weeks than all than in all wars in 2022 on all fronts in the world, including the Ukraine war. All of them together had less children killed during those seven weeks. This is from the New York Times, not any source that uh, is, uh, can, <coughs> and you could suspect of being uh, anti-Israel or, or, uh, or whatever. So this, this has been definitely a genocide, a genocidal war. If you add to it also the, the displacement of 1.5 million Gazans from the north to the south, that's more than half the population of the Gaza Strip. So you have a massive displacement of people, and that's also part of, uh, of uh, the qualification of, of genocide, all the more that the intention is clear among uh, uh, people in the, in the Israeli government uh, wanting these to go and resettle elsewhere, either in Egypt or in the rest of the world. That's point one. Point two is that it couldn't be but a genocide. Any idea that a war whose goal is the eradication of Hamas between quote marks can be anything else but a genocide would have been completely stupid. And that's obvious. I mean, anyone knowing what, does, what it means to eradicate an organization of several thousands or tens of thousands of members that have been ruling uh, a, a, a territory, a, a little territory like uh, Gaza, the idea of eradicating this organization meant necessarily the uh, perpetration of a genocide, meant necessarily what we have seen. Until now, just for one half of Gaza, 15,000 people killed, uh, if it carries on, you can imagine what the rest will be, all the more that the population density now in the southern part where they are going to, to continue the war is much higher than the, the, the northern part because of the displacement of this 1.2, when 1.5 million, million, uh, million people. Therefore, point three, because it couldn't be anything else, all those who supported this operation the, the Israeli onslaught on Gaza, 
and supported it unconditionally, without even wanting to call for a ceasefire, objecting to the calls for a ceasefire and, and describing the calls for a ceasefire as pro-Hamas or whatever. All those, and the UK government is among them uh, in the first place, of course, and the United States and the US government, all of those are complicit in this genocide. This is absolutely important. They are accomplices of this absolutely appalling uh, genocide that has been uh, going on. And the fourth, my fourth and last point is that solidarity in this case is not just letting out your anger. It is effective. It is absolutely, absolutely crucial actually. And we can see the effect of the, the global wave of solidarity, including in the United States itself, including in polls showing the impact of the Biden uh, administration's position on their uh, electoral prospect for next year, we can see how much this has impacted them. They sent Blinken today to, to Gaza to try to convince the Israeli government to prolong the, the truce and are trying without saying it to turn that into a permanent ceasefire, but they won't say the term, and trying to find solutions that could be agreeable to the Israeli government. And I'm, I have a little optimism, actually, about the uh, ability of, of getting that, because this is a relatively weak US government give, with, the, uh, with a Congress hostile to, to it and very much pro-Israel. And you have a far-right government in Israel, and which is part of the picture that should have been taken into account by those Western governments that supported this genocide. So that's why it's absolutely vital and crucial to carry on our solidarity with Gaza. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. That was um, on time. And, uh, and an important intervention uh, to start our uh, town hall event tonight. Um, Firyal Awan is our next speaker, and she is uh, a lecturer in media and post-colonial studies at the Institute of Ind uh, Education at University College uh, London. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me so much. What, what an incredible honor. I'm sorry, I've lost my voice a bit, so I'm going to be reading from my paper, not because I've lost my voice, but also because I've, I think every word matters and I want to get every word right. So I'm sorry I'm going to do that terrible present, present, uh, presentation thing where I'm going to be reading from my paper. Um, so thank you for inviting me. What I want to use my seven or so minutes is to talk about the French colonization of Algeria and to talk about this exceptionalization of Palestine to make connections between Algeria and, um, and Palestine and also to talk about the importance of transnational solidarity and how it's very important that we make these very important connections between different struggles for national and um, for liberation. So my mother is Algerian. Um, she comes from a family that was very active in the movement for national liberation. Uh, so Algeria, as you all probably know because you're a SOAS, one, um, Independence after a very violent war fought against the French from 1954 to 1962. And the 1960s and the 70s, it became a very important hub for international movements. So under the two socialist regimes of Ahmed Ben Bella and Hawari Boumidian, the country attracted a lot of leftists and revolutionaries of all different kinds of stripes. So um, including the American Black Panther, as well as South African and Palestinian liberation movements as well to the extent that um, Amilcar Cabral, one of, the one of the foremost African revolutionaries, called it um, the Mecca of revolutions. And this, in the 60s and 70s, was a very important time for transnational solida solidarity. So you can imagine the, the Black Panther movement, the Black Panthers, the Algerian Liberation Movement, the FLN, the PLO, the South Africans, they were all together in close, close proximity. And they were organizing together, they were discussing together, and they were seeing these links against racism and imperialism. So to give an example, in 1969, um, the very famous Eldridge Cleveridge from the Exile Black Panther movement, he set up the new African American Information Center in Algiers. Um, and that, at that event, to celebrate this event, the PLO was there and was represented obviously by Fatah. And they issued a statement entitled to our African brothers. And in this statement, they contended that while they're not part of Africa, the continent, they wholeheartedly supported it, and they were part of Africa, the cause. 
So this shared history of oppression against occupation, against colonialism, against br uh, police brutality, has inspired a history of black Palestinian solidarity. And you've recently, it's recently been awakened in the Black Lives Matter movement after the killing of uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson in 2014. You saw those kind of connections being made again. And there's also a long history of Palestinian identification with Al the Algerian independence movement and vice versa. And there are many, many parallels that you can see from France's colonial occupation to the checkpoints, house demolition, separation barriers, whereas, where, as well as other forms of more kind of like genteel violence. So having lived through this war of Algerian national liberation and a new friend, uh, free Algeria, my mom has a lot of stories of Palestinians. So the stories she has are the ordinariness of Palestinian life. So Palestinian men in their kafiyas, playing shesh besh, playing coffee in these cafe shops. But she also has stories that are more significant to her. So the Palestinian teachers who taught her Arabic in primary and secondary school, whose name she still remembers. So these kind of attempts at diminishing the Arabic language and hence Arabic language and culture from the public sphere is something, another tactic that the Zionist regime and the French regime had in common. So during the French rule, Arabic was completely banned in schools. So children, Algerian children were not allowed to learn Arabic. They only could learn French. And when Algeria gained its independence, the Algerian government reversed the situation, but they had nobody to teach Arabic. So nobody knew Arabic, the actual Arabic. So they invited teachers from the Sham region, from Syria, from Palestine to come and teach um, Arabic. So my mom's Arabic teachers were all Alger uh, French and she has, um, sorry, Palestinian and she has lots of stories of, um, of Palestinians. So it's really no surprise that I chose to study Palestine. Um, I did my PhD research in Palestine. I've been to Palestine many times. Um, the first time I visited Palestine was in 2007, and that was the year that Gaza was, was besieged. For the next 10 years, I visited annually for research, for workshops, weddings, births, funerals, you name it, I was there every year. And anyone here with a Muslim name or an Arab face or Muslim looking will know that navigating the Israeli racist regime is very hard. It's very hard entering Palestine as a Muslim and Arab person. But for more, most of us, at least it's possible. And that's not what I can say for my Palestinian friends who live in exile. So lots of my Palestinian friends who live in, U in the UK or in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, they don't have that right of return. So they can't return to Palestine even as um, tourists. Actually, in fact, it's near to impossible for Palestinians in the West Bank or those who have green IDs uh, to travel to Gaza or to travel to historic Palestine or even travel to Jerusalem. And as you all now know now that the situation is in Gaza is even, is even more desperate, where a lot of the people will have never, lift, never left the Gaza Strip. So my ability to move freely and travel to Palestine has made me feel very uneasy, un uncomfortable, and also very ashamed. Um, and I always feel like, why should I enjoy this privilege of getting to know this beautiful land? Um, and those that have farmed the land, who have connections going back centuries, are not allowed to to enter this land. And it's not just me, there are many, many people who have this privilege of entering Palestine. So you may be surprised to know that um, Ramallah, which is the, the kind of de facto capital of um, the West Bank, is full of internationals. So it's full of international organizations uh, and people as well. So you have lots and lots of foreigners, what, what Palestinians call ajanib, in, in Ramallah, in, in East Jerusalem, working for Save the Children, for, working for WHO, working for news bureaus, um, work, you know, doing all sorts of stuff there. And Palestine is also a very heavily researched area as well, so you'll have lots of researchers there as well. Um, and then you'll have lots of people who just kind of like digital nomads who just travel in Palestine and they'll be working there, living there, paying Palestinian rent, whereas um, paying their taxes to the countries where they're from. Um, so what you see is that lots of people, so people with lots of powerful passports, have access to Palestine and Palestinians. And under normal circumstances, these people are talking a lot about Palestine. So what I mean about no normal circumstances is kind of like safer when we're not in the midst of a, of a genocide, but you have like normal, ordinary killings happening every day. People are talking about Palestine. They are using the knowledge that they've gathered in Palestine to publish in prestigious journals, to write books, to give talks, get promotions, and all of that sort. But what I'm finding now is 
that many of these people that I've encountered in the last 10 years who've built their knowledge or built their careers on the back of Palestinian knowledge are very eerily silent. I know lots of people who study Palestine who are very silent. Um, and there are many reasons that people are silent. There's the hostile environment, and many people worry about their visa status. Other people are worried about um, their family safety or the safety of their own selves or their family. And the, I believe that there are many people who don't feel the duty or obligation to, to speak up. And I totally disagree. And I think that the only way that one can ethically, ethically travel to Palestine and work there or research there is for your central aim or central goal should be one of liberation. And now, in particular, with the genocide in Gaza and these threats to our academic freedom, it's not the time to be silent. Now is the time that we must really use our voices, however cracked they are. <laughs> we have to use our voices and use our platforms and to amplify Palestinian voices and the Palestinian cause. So like Mahavish was saying, what we see in 2023 is Palestine is really becoming the defining moment of our time the global implications of this occupation is becoming clear for everyone to see. And we know that settler colonialism, the struggle against settler colonialism is, is a very shared one. You can see from the Algerian example and also the example um, in, in America. And I feel like all of this oppression is, is linked and uh, Palestine is kind of at the intersection of pretty much all of these systems of, of oppression. So by seeing the struggle as a shared one rather than exceptionalizing Palestine, the people on the ground, so the activists on the ground, those in Gaza, those in Ferguson, those in Standing Rock, in um, Congo, in the Sudan, Sheikh Jarrah, everywhere, Calais, Lesbos, Algiers, they're kind of picking up the mantle of revolutionaries past, revolutionaries of the past, and they're showing the importance of transnational solidarity in challenging these kind of racist and imperialist structures that govern our lives. And I believe that a free Palestine is necessary for our liberation, it's necessary for the liberation of all the people, and none of us is free, like that cliche or that common thing we hear, none of us is free until all of us are free. All of us are free and peace can only be attained when justice is served. And I'd like to quote an um, Egyptian comrade who says, we are not freeing Palestine, Palestine is freeing us. It's thanks to the people of Palestine and Gaza that we're able to taste this bit of freedom. We owe them everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virial. Um, I now invite uh, Professor Des uh, Friedman, who is Professor of Media and Communication at Goldsmiths. And I apologize ahead of time because we couldn't put up his PowerPoint, but I hope it's going to be okay. Just use your imaginations. So I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the media and, and, Gaza, uh, and Gaza. And I know it's a truism to say this, that there is an information battleground that reinforces the military battleground. But it just because it's a truism, doesn't mean it's not important to repeat this and to hold to account all those media outlets who are complicit in the genocide. Now, the first point I want to make is that I don't believe it is the fault of all journalists. Um, actually, according to the latest figures from the independent non-profit group, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, at least, this is a minimum, of 57 journalists and media workers have been killed since the 7th of October uh, in the region, all but four of whom um, have been killed as, as a result of Israeli airstrikes. Um, there's also a further 11 journalists who've been injured, three missing, and 19 reported as arrested. So this is partly a war on predominantly Palestinian journalists, as well, which is what I'm going to talk about, as a war in which Western journalists are playing a central role through their asymmetrical framing of what's going on. Now, there is nothing new about this. There's nothing new about a lot of what we're going to be discussing here. Um, just as this war did not start on the 7th of October, there is a long history of reporting on Israel and Palestine in a way that marginalises history, that marginalises context, that doesn't speak of occupation, and that too often uncritically reproduces official Israeli government and military sources. Uh, you know, evidence of this was from, this is a long debate, back in 2006, the BBC governors, as they existed at the time, they commissioned an internal report um, to look into this, and they remarked, in their own words, on, quote, how little history or context is routinely offered 
when reporting on Israel and, and Palestine. They noted in their words, the failure to convey adequately the disparity, the disparity in the Israeli and Palestinian experience, reflecting the fact that one side is in control and the other lives under occupation. These are the words of an internal report of the BBC. So you might be scratching your head thinking, how have we got from those words to the actual coverage today, which is uh, replicating precisely these problems? One evidence that I like, a uh, piece of evidence I like to talk about is the explainers. I've become slightly obsessed by the explainers that all news organisations feel they have to give. Um, the BBC one, which is updated regularly, I checked it earlier today, it still starts, its chronology starts on the 7th of October, 2023. For example, the Al Jazeera explainer um, starts um, by arguing, this is in the very first sentence, that the current conflict, quote, has its roots in a colonial act carried out more than a century ago. Which one is lacking context, which one is acknowledging that this is a deeply historical situation. So just as we need to insist on historical memory, we also need to make clear the difference in power between the Israeli state and Palestinians. One side has the upper hand in terms of guns, bombs, aircraft, propaganda machines, as well as support in palaces, parliaments and the press, while the other has little to defend itself um, with apart from widespread support on the streets, which I'll return to at the end. How does this manifest itself inside the media? I would argue, I've only got time to argue, give two um, explanations. One, very obviously, is in the language that is used, where Israeli and Palestinian lives are treated differently and unequally. The former are hostages, the latter are detainees. The former are described as children, the latter are described as, I'm sure you're familiar with this, teenage males. Israelis are citizens, while Palestinians are human shields. Let me just focus on the BBC, not least because the BBC, as with other public service broadcasters, is supposed, to, is required to be impartial, whereas newspaper outlets have no such requirements on them. So you would expect the BBC to try and... Um, address this requirement to be impartial. There's lots of examples I could give. Tweets all the way through since the 7th of October treat these two peoples in very, very different ways. Uh, one of the earliest tweets not on the 9th of October with 25 million views stated that, quote, more than 500 uh, Palestinian people have died in Gaza, but um, in the same tweet they mentioned that more than 700 Israeli peoples have been killed. Uh, in another report on the 17th of October, Israelis murdered at the Rayyan Music Festival were described as massacred. In the same tweet, Palestinians were merely killed in airstrikes. A BBC story about pro-Palestinian marches across the UK uh, on the 22nd of October specifically drew a distinction between the, quote, atrocities committed by Hamas, but the suffering in Gaza. You find these across output all the time. That's one element, just what's the language used, but I think also it's worth thinking about the agendas, what, what is not just there, but what is also not there. So what we do see is, for example, lots of um, uh, idea footage of tunnels, um, and in the case of the BBC, they're very, well, I would say unhelpfully um, uh, uh, tweeted in the middle of October, I think it was, uh, and this was a tweet with something like 25 million views again. You know, this matters when it's this kind of audience. And the tweet was, quote, does Hamas build tunnels under hospitals and schools? Using the hashtag, uh, BBC, your questions answered. It's obviously a question that the IDF would be much happier to ask than the people of Gaza. In terms of what is not shown, I'm just thinking today, what about the babies in incubators at Al Nasser Hospital? What about, in particular... Um, as we've already heard today, about, the, about investigating whether this is a genocide or not. You find Al Jazeera t are obsessed. I shouldn't say obsessed. That sounds like it's unhealthy. They are very interested in answering this question. Um, the, the BBC, I mean, I, I looked at the hashtag. There's been one reference to genocide on the BBC World um, uh, X feed since the 7th of October, and that was only when it was reporting on a very negative um, uh, a criticism of the US uh, Palestinian congresswoman who mentioned genocide. So the story wasn't even about whether there was genocide, it was just attacking her. Um, and um, 
you know, it's, this is a huge matter of public debate. Other outlets are investigating this, but there's this silence, there's an absence, and I think that's just as important when we're thinking about what's, what's going on. Um, so I think all of this supports a conception that Palestinian lives are somehow less valuable than Israeli ones, or indeed, I should say, less valuable than Ukrainian ones. The BBC has had dozens of stories mentioning genocide in relation to Ukraine in the last year, but as I say, nothing in, in relation to what's going on in Gaza. Now, there are, of course, lots of exceptions, and you can't paint the media with a single brush. Um, and it was interesting, Reuters, for example, as an international news agency, well, as soon as the pause was announced, they actually did very uniquely refer to both Israeli and Palestinian hostages. They, they called them equally. That's very much the exception that proves the rule for me, that by and large, Western media are working within a frame that takes for granted Israel's security needs and its place in the world and kind of sees, at a very general level, Palestinians as rock throwers and potential or actual terrorists. Now, some of this conception has, been, has had to change a little bit precisely because of the severity of what's going on in Gaza and the fact that its actions are generating so much international protest. So you have started to see critical headlines in places like New York Times and CNN, who are traditionally firm supporters of Israel, not because they have suddenly changed their, their, their world view. I think it just reflects the fact that the US administration is a little embarrassed and frustrated that it's had to justify the bombing of hospitals and the killing of babies. And so you start to see some cracks in this very well-established consensus. Just to finish, what does that mean for all of us? Well, the first thing for me is that where there are some small cracks in this consensus, as I say, it's not down to them changing their minds or some kind of in, innate pluralism in the media. It's as a result of what we have already done, of international protest. And so I think for those of us who want an end to occupation and a permanent ceasefire, we need to step up our campaigning and increase our noise. That, for me, is the best way to prise apart the consensus on Israel and Palestine that has dominated Western governments and media for so long. The sheer scale of the international mobilizations to demand a ceasefire, to show solidarity with the people of Gaza, has started to crack open this consensus and the hope by many Western leaders that we're going to get tired of organising resistance and that pro protest will somehow fizzle out, we need to actually show we are not yet tired, and we will not be tired until there is uh, peace and justice for the people in Gaza. Mainstream media will not represent our movement, nor hold to account those governments who are complicit in the destruction of Gaza because they are overwhelmingly tied to an imperial worldview. The responsibility... I'm afraid, lies instead with people like yourselves. It lies with the striking stu school students who have taken action in the last couple of weeks. It lies with the dot workers who have shown amazing courage and solidarity in refusing to load some of the, the, the boats for arms to Israel. And it lies most immediately with the marchers across the world who have absolutely intensified the pressure on governments and the media to, uh, 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 to make it impossible to justify what is going on now. Uh, it is for those of us struggling for justice and peace in the Middle East to intensify our action as the best response to the media's failures. Thank you. Thank you, Des. And uh, now uh, is Professor Alison Scott Bowman, who is Professor of Society and Belief at SOAS. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. And Rana, thank you very much for being here. Rana is one of my team. She's brilliant. Um, I want to talk today about talking to strangers would be my title if I had a title. Um, Rana and I work together on a project which involves us pricking the bubble of Westminster, actually going into the corridors of power and speaking truth to power and insisting on being heard and insisting on not being silenced. And also the, the price we pay is that we have to have conversations with people with whom we fundamentally disagree and who are not gonna change their view, but with whom there may be some, some arrangement possible about a peace for Palestine and a peace for Israel because none of this is good for Israel either. Think about 2008. 2014, on both those occasions, the mantra was, 
not to destroy Hamas at that point, but we will take down Hamas. We will weaken them immeasurably. The world woke up, the world became struck with compassion, and then the world went to sleep again. This must not happen this time. And one of the ways in which you could, if you're interested, I better look at my time so I don't get carried away. One of the ways you could, if you're interested, um, work with us is to actually decide that talking to strangers who don't, who, whose ideas you don't like might be useful. So first point is we issue briefings. We issue one-page briefings in everyday language written by experts. They go to every MP and every member of the House of Lords. And we've issued two on this situation. One on Gaza. At the time, it was quite early on when maybe 4,000 were dead. And the other one was written by two NHS doctors about the health situation, which is now immeasurably worse. But we were desperate because, I mean, why should the government actually be voting on a ceasefire? They, sh they shouldn't have to vote on whether they want a ceasefire or not, whether they want to support it. So we were enraged. Our anger fueled us. And those went out, as I say, we do a lot of briefings, and those went out and we will do more. We also can tell you, I don't know, Ron, if wants to tell me at the end where I've missed anything out, there are interventions. Whatever you think about this government or any future government, there are procedures that are not damaged, not contaminated by anybody who's in power. Procedures like asking a question of a minister through an MP. Procedures like forcing an early day motion, which means that on the floor of the House of Commons, Gaza would be discussed. We have to discuss it. If we provide a briefing which gives the basic data for an MP, they are grateful. This has been, this has been done before um, with our work. Um, we also have uh, the possibility to, co to work with other groupings in Parliament. That leads my to my next point, which is that we have actually now set up an all-party parliamentary group which means that we are allowed to physically run sessions in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords, the same place, just a different corridor, and, um, and in Portcullis House where all the MPs have their rooms. We've run sessions on reparations. That was a very hot session, very uh, complicated, but very good. We've run sessions with other APGs in Afghanistan. I think we should run... This is such a long job, isn't it? The, the chaos that's been cr created in Gaza is going to take years to resolve. I mean, nobody knows how to do it. So uh, for the long haul, we've got these structures set up and we can animate your rage by giving you a platform, by running um, these panels. Um, the next point I want to make is that we now have a student society um, attached to ICOP. If you look up SOAS, ICOP, I know it's a bit cheesy, but ICOP stands for Influence in the Corridors of Power. Nothing like hubris to keep you going. Um, as a student society, we've taken students with us into the House of Commons. We ran a session, we ran a panel the other week on prevent. And we had a, um, a doctoral student from SOAS giving evidence. And we also had the government's um, advisor on <coughs> counterterrorism on the panel. So we bring, in, we bring in people who disagree with us. This is what I mean about talking to strangers. He disagreed with us, we disagreed with him, but he was prepared to share a, um, a space with us and to possibly make some modifications in due course. We have to hope. We have to hope. Um, may I also say that um, we believe very strongly that when the election comes, we can facilitate, we can improve, we can work with the student union to improve the possibility that you're going to vote. So automatic voter registration is coming on stream, I think. I think there are lots of ways in which we can ensure that students, it's called the Sheffield model, as a, a Labour MP in Sheffield has been working on this for some time, we can make it more likely that you will sort of hold your nose against the political structures and the possibilities of who's going to be in power and nevertheless vote. So this is really important. And you could exact a price in a metaphorical sense. You could choose... Um, candidates or prospective candidates and suggest to them that you will vote for them if they show compassion for this crisis, if they are prepared to sue for peace, if they really are seriously prepared to engage with the Palestinian crisis. So there are many things that can be done um, and I, I hope that you won't turn away from these ideas because we are 
we, we can make a difference and you, your voice needs to be heard in Westminster. I mean, it's terrible swirly carpets and awful neo-Gothic um, architecture. It's, it's laughable. It's fun to be there because it's so silly. And all these dead white men lining the, lining the corridors. And, and yes, some of the live ones are also. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do, can I give a little plug for my husband's book? If you really want to understand the situation, you should read, you should work with Dina and Gilbert and others on the panel who've done very deep, sophisticated work. My husband has written what one might call a primer. This is the American version. The English version is called Palestinians and Israelis, um, a short history of conflict. And you do need to Maybe you know all this already, but I don't. I'm still struggling to know the facts that it's a very, very complex situation that's been going on for, what, 75 years plus? And the ups and downs and the machinations of the power that has been abused against the Palestinians is extreme. So if you're, if you're prepared to talk to strangers, you need to be able to counter the commentaries they come out with and present to them the facts. The facts are very powerful and they speak for themselves and I think, um, have I missed anything out Rana? Probably have but anyway. Rana's a brilliant doctoral student here. Fantastic team and we hope that you will join us in the struggle which it is possible to do something about in Westminster if, if you believe me. I don't know if you believe me but I hope you believe me. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and now we have uh, Dr. Amir Shalan, who is director of the educational, Palestinian educational organization, Makan, and she's the chair of the British Palestinian Committee. Thank you. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the co-optation of international solidarity and the shrinking space for those speaking out against the ongoing repression of Palestinians today. I mean, it has been truly devastating to witness over the last seven weeks the horrific scenes of Israel's destruction of Gaza and the ramping up of its military violence, mass arrests and forcible displacement of Palestinians in the West Bank as well. While the unequivocal support and encouragement for Israel's genocidal attack by Britain, the US, and other international actors has been deeply wounding for Palestinians everywhere. On a more positive note, and it has already been mentioned, amongst the public, we've seen the largest upswell of solidarity with Palestinians ever, with millions of people around the world taking to the streets, shutting down train stations, in some cases people resigning for their jobs in protest, and refusing to load boats with weapons meant for Israel. As a colleague of mine put it recently, there is, however, an unprecedented radical intimacy to what we are experiencing today. The situation in Palestine is having an impact on people's personal and professional relationships outside in a way that is extremely challenging, not only for Palestinians, but for those who want to stand in solidarity with us. And I want, first of all, just to talk a little bit about the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people and the way that it is observed by the United Nations on or around the 29th of November every year in accordance with General Assembly mandates contained in two resolutions, one that was passed in December 1977 and um, then again in December 1979. According to the UN, the 29th of November was chosen, as we heard a bit earlier, because, um, in their words, of its meaning and significance to the Palestinian people. But, of course, on that day in 1947, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 181, which became known as the Partition Resolution, dividing Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. It's important to remember here, though, the role of the Balfour Declaration as well and the, the British mandate that paved the way for the partition re resolution, which was in no way wanted by the Palestinian people, promising away Palestine, as Edward Said put it, in flat disregard of both the presence and wishes of the native majority. 
One of the many issues with the Balfour Declaration is that it promised political rights to Jewish communities in Palestine, but relegated what it designated as non-Jewish communities who represented over 90% of the population as just having civil or religious rights and much less protection. Essentially, then, the partition plan officially legitimised and legalised settler colonialism and is an early example of how, or the extent to which, the UN's function has in fact been to take the lines of European powers and operate as a vehicle to legitimise their agendas. Today, the hypocrisy of international law has been writ large over Gaza, with governments in the global north not just turning a blind eye, but defending the indefensible, as Israel has imposed a complete siege on the people of Gaza, killing over 15,000 people, raising whole neighbourhoods to the ground, targeting hospitals, schools and places of worship. So when we talk about solidarity today, it's important to remember the way in which the UN's previous 1977 resolution um, to mark, um, sorry, the, the way in which the 1977 resolution to mark the 29th of November as a day of solidarity superseded a previous UN General Assembly resolution in 1975 that had been led by Arab states with the help of the USSR. And that one had situated the Palestinian struggle as an anti-colonial, anti-racist movement and connected Israel with the racist regimes in Zimbabwe and South Africa at that time calling for the elimination of racial discrimination in all its forms, as well as recognition of the dignity of peoples and their right to self-determination. That resolution was then ultimately revoked in 1991, following pressure from Israel and the US. And from then on, the notion of Palestinian liberation was reduced to a peace-building narrative that fails to take into account key historical facts or to address root causes including the mass dispossession of Palestine's indigenous population, which prefaced the creation of the State of Israel and the raft of discriminatory policies and practices that it has carried out ever since. It is against this background that it has become so difficult today to be vocally supportive of Palestinian liberation without coming under extremely hostile attack. And these attacks come in various forms, from the demonization and defamation of people and organizations, to surveillance and suspicion of particular groups, and attacks on nonviolent civil society tactics, such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, which are really calling for Israel's accountability. At the same time, the chilling effect of the IHRA definition which has been adopted by many educational and cultural edu institutions, has a malleability that means it can be used to justify virtually any allegation of anti-Semitism. People then are frightened to speak out or simply exhausted by the relentless attacks. But amidst all this, there's a new generation of Palestinians who are seizing the opportunity to revive regional and international solidarity movements connecting with a global reawakening against racism, author authoritarianism, and the new populist right. The links here with these intersectional grassroots movements, they're fostered not based on identity politics, but on a shared recognition of similarities between their experiences and the systems and conditions that they face and their struggles for equality and freedom. In this context, then, what does solidarity mean today? It means centering Palestinian voices, not only so that they can tell their family histories, their personal stories of dispossession and displacement, and their lives under military assault, but so that they can shape the conversation about their right to self-determination and their right of return. It means using language that acknowledges the Palestinian struggle as an anti-racist and anti-colonial struggle, and it means resisting the chilling effect of hostile policies and practices that close down critical thinking and transformative education by weaponizing the very notion of safeguarding to the extent that public institutions have been focusing on protecting people who are upset by the use of terms like apartheid or ethnic cleansing or genocide 
rather than protecting those who are suffering the devastating impact of these very real policies and practices. So what we truly need at this moment is not safe spaces, but many more brave spaces like this one. Thank you. Thank you, Aimé. Thank you very much. And um, last but not least, I invite Dr. Rafif Ziade, Senior Lecturer in Politics and Public Pol Policy at uh, King's College L London, but best known as a poet and activist. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I wanted to start by being very honest. I am a poet, technically, and academic and both of these things deal in words, um, but it's been very, very difficult to find words, and I want to acknowledge that. And it's not just the televised massacres that we have seen, it's not just the numbers of deaths, it's the life-changing injuries, the flesh and bones burned and broken, the trauma we will all live with, the trauma that for most Palestinians is on repeat and has been on repeat for 75 years. I was born into a siege of a different city. I was born into the siege of Beirut with a different bombardment. And the scenes we have seen in Gaza have been no different, just more intense. The shelling of hospitals, the babies shaking, no fault except being Palestinian. It is also not the women and children, although that has become a mantra, the women and the children, and we all repeat it. And it's true that the majority of Gaza's population are under the age of 18, but it is not just the women and children. Our men, every one of them, a life, a moon, an entire constellation. They have lifted the world on their shoulders for a month now, comforting babies, saving lives, looking under the rubble. They are no less worthy than the women and the children, and I will not be mourning them any less. And unfortunately, unfortunately, to be Palestinian is always to be thinking ahead of the next massacre and the next genocide and to be thinking of how do we organize to make this stop. For us, it's not periodic, it's not episodic, it has been our life for 75 years. It has not only affected Palestinians, it has affected the entire region, the Lebanese people, the Syrian people, the Iraqi people, the fact that Israel has existed in our region the way it has, has traumatized all of us and has caused violence for all of us, and I want to acknowledge that. But this ugliness and brutality by Israel that was unleashed and cheered by this British government, the US government, and the EU, the same states that give Israel consistent diplomatic cover and continue their military aid to the settler colonial project over the entirety of the Palestinian people. And the opposition in this country that has made it a commitment to get into power by being the most boring, policyless opposition in the world could not get it to even vote for a ceasefire. So I appreciate the nods to working in the halls of power but the halls of power have completely abandoned Palestine. They have worked against Palestine. And I think if we really want to move them, we need to build people power. And that's what the demonstrations have been about. In the past month, we have seen many so-called liberal values come crashing down. Freedom of expression, out the door. Freedom of protest, we never really needed it anyway. Academic freedom, well, maybe for some, but not for others, if they don't happen to be Ukrainian, if you happen to be Palestinian, you're not blonde, blue-eyed, academic freedom doesn't really apply to you. We have seen academics' questions for tweets. We have seen our marches called hate marches. We have seen MPs not responding to their own constituencies and voting against a ceasefire, even though public opinion is for a ceasefire. So it's not just Palestine that is facing the brutality of the bombing. It is the system here that has been really put under a magnifying glass. They keep telling us that these are liberal democracies. 
how is it even a liberal democracy when there are a million people on the street calling for a ceasefire and public opinion is for a ceasefire and MPs sit there gaslighting all of us and saying it's a pause, not a ceasefire, that's what we want, playing around with words when we have an entire city decimated to the ground. And I know we keep talking about the violence and the decimation, but Gaza is also beautiful. Gaza is a Mediterranean city. It is like every other Mediterranean city has seen the violence and the savagery of many, many colonizers, and it will rise out of this stronger. At the same time, we have seen mass mobilizations, impressive creative actions by ordinary people, workers, and students all around the world. Students have walked out from London to Australia. Dock workers have refused to handle Israeli ships. There's a lot more work to be done. Each of us who's an organizer in this room is exhausted. Just to tell you the level of racism we have been enduring. One of the unions I was speaking to in Europe, a German union, said these statements can't be coming from Palestinian trade unions because the English is too good. That is what we have had to battle in order to get work going, but we have done it because this is what we always do because the burden is on us to stand for justice and the burden is on us to mobilize people and the burden is on us to be the activists who have to watch every word that we say while we're consistently interrogated whenever we're on the media. And here, I want to give a shout out to every Palestinian that has been on the mainstream media, including my co-panelists, because that is also a violence that we endure consistently being interrogated in public, knowing very well that the atmosphere in this country is against us. That also takes bravery. But there's a continuous need to explain the specifics and the operations and the intricacies of Israeli settler colonialism and what the project has looked like for all Palestinians. I know that when we are in Western acad academic spaces, we often think of this onslaught against us and the silencing against us. And I know it's very difficult with the media in this country to realize that the majority world stands with Palestine. And it's not because Palestine is an exception and it's not because a Palestinian child is different from a Yemeni child. It is because freedom for Palestine is freedom for all. It is because our struggle is connected to struggles of the oppressed everywhere. And Palestinians have been very clear about that. Over decades, Israeli settler colonialism has been acting with support of Western powers and their regional allies to fragment the Palestinian people. It is a, it is a very purposeful policy of disintegration of Palestinians, resulting in a set of disjointed, dispersed territories, hoping that we will forget that we are one indigenous nation. This stratification is reflected in the categories. They call us Palestinians of 48, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinian refugees, Palestinians from the West Bank, Palestinians from Gaza. Jerusalem is now being cut off from the West Bank as if it's its own separate territory being occupied. Jerusalem used to be the economic heart of the West Bank. In other words, Israeli settler colonialism and power relies not just on the geographical fragmentation of the Palestinian nation, but on assaulting our very history, dehistoricizing the Palestinian experience and reducing it to accepting fragmentation as de facto permanent. It is especially difficult to be in this country with its colonial past the country that passed the Belfort Declaration and continues to celebrate it. They had celebrations for the Belfort Declaration as if Palestinians don't exist and the, the suffering of 75 years did not exist. It is this fragmentation that makes it possible today to speak of Gazans, for example, with no reference to how this category itself was constructed through the, the fragmentation of the Palestinian people as a whole. We keep saying the majority of Gaza are refugees. The majority of Gaza are refugees because this was created with the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And the Israeli strategy has been the same, has been the same from 48 to 67. It is to control as much of the land with the least number of people. That basic strategy hasn't changed. We can make it academic. We can write lots of books about it. 
I know many people who build their careers writing about it, but that's the basic premise of this settler colonial project. It is a testament to the Palestinian people that we have not broken, that across Palestine and in our exile, we still remember that we are Palestinian and we still claim our right to return to our lands. So this is an important moment to remember that Gaza is part and parcel of the Palestinian nation. Today, it stands as the best of us. Today, it stands as our symbol for return. And remember the marches of return. When they keep claiming, why aren't you nonviolent? The marches of return, people walked through to the gates and Israel responded with violence. The ramifications of this fragmentation, geographic, temporal, economic, it's a process that is far reaching. It contributes to narrowing down our political vision and our imagination. It leaves us wanting slivers of land and some autonomy to collect the garbage and maybe run a hospital, but not real freedom. And this was what the Oslo process helped to entrench. It helped, helped to entrench this idea and it helped with the fragmentation of the West Bank from the Gaza Strip. So when we analyze Israel as a settler colonial state, we are organizing against this fragmentation. We are organizing for real freedom. As Israel's campaign escalated, Palestinian trade unions called for their counterparts internationally and all people of conscience around the world to end complicity with Israel's crime. I have been one of the international coordinators for this campaign, and I am very proud to say that some of the, we are starting to have some results at the international level. The call most urgently focused on the arms trade as the bombs were dropping and funding for military research. The call asked clearly, the time for action is now, Palestinian lives hang in the balance. It also called on other worker actions historically from Italy, South Africa, United States, when people refused to handle South African goods, but also the way the trade union movement acted against Ch uh, Pinochet's Chile, for example, and all the inspiring actions that happened then. And the asks were very simple, to refuse to build weapons destined for Israel, refuse to transport weapons to Israel. I'm very happy to say today that all major trade unions in the Spanish state have called for a military embargo and signed the statement and declared it today. I'm very happy to announce today that tomorrow, for the first time, we're going to have coordinated action across nine ports in Europe for work stoppages in the middle of the day against the arms trade with Israel. These things did not happen accidentally. They happened because we organized. They happened because Palestinian trade unionists under fire and under bombing signed that call and, that, and decided that we want to ask for ethical solidarity. The demonstrations are important. Clearly in this country, it was very important to go out in mass numbers against Suella Braverman, thank God she's gone. <laughs> but it's also important to continue to organize. In the university sector, UCU branches up and down the country are passing motions for boycotts, divestments, and sanctions. Again, we need to make these actionable. Our union technically has a position on BDS. We want to see the action that comes out of these motions. A lot of activist energy goes into these motions. We really need the research to end that complicity. I do not want my pension fund invested in arms companies. It's that simple. We work, it's our money, we don't want it invested in arms companies. We have to highlight the destruction of the Palestinian educational sector. Every university in Gaza has been bombed, bombed. There was disgusting footage of Israeli soldiers celebrating inside a hall of a Palestinian university. That is unacceptable. Students in their student unions are also organizing and we need to bring that work from our UCU branches with the student unions to start mobilizing for long-term action. As I said, for Palestinians, this is not episodic. It has been our life for 75 years. So we have gone out into the streets, we have demonstrated, but more than anything, I don't want to go back to normal because there was no normal. Gaza has been under siege. 
The West Bank has been occupied and the death rate since October 7th has been a thousand people in the West Bank. The ethnic cleansing is continuing as we are speaking. Palestinian refugees are denied the right to return. Palestinian citizens of Israel are treated as third class citizens and their lands are being stolen. There was no normal. So if there's anything we take out of this moment and all of this organizing is let's take our rage, let's take our pain and turn it into long-term organizing and people power because we don't want to go back to the normality of no normal that we used to have. Thank you. Thank you, Rafif. Um, a very good uh, rousing speech that I hope people will take and, and think about in terms of what we do. Um, but I remember, because you mentioned something, uh, I remembered we wrote once in a book called Being Palestinian as Palestinians in Diaspora. And my cousin wrote something and he said, it's actually a pain <laughs> to, to be a Palestinian because you all, you know, you're, you're always reminded of it, but in very violent ways. Um, with this in mind, I would like to ask whether any of the panelists want to comment on other of other, uh, you know, other panelists' papers, um, and whether we have any questions. We have a microphone that can go around if there are any questions. So there's one there, two, um, yeah, one. Thank you, Kelly. So we're going to take a couple of couple questions, or maybe three together. Okay, uh, Kelly, thank you very much. Um, this is a question for Dr. Ziade. My name is Dr. Khan, I'm an NHS surgeon. Um, hi, Dr. Ziade, hi. Um, looking at your, uh, uh, your title, I think it says that you're a senior lecturer in politics and public policy at King's College London. Um, I have been on demonstrations myself for the past uh, four weeks. I think I've been on four demonstrations in total. And one of the things that left me a little bit disillusioned was that people, in there, hundreds of thousands come to the demonstrations, they come, they wave flags, they chant, and then they get to the uh, front of the demonstration and they leave and they're left none the wiser in terms of how they can really, you know, affect change. Now, I've been uh, talking to a couple of people about how we need to be involved in politics a little bit more. My understanding is, uh, having spoken to an MP recently, is that uh, some two years ago, or was it maybe four years ago, a conscious effort by Zionist lobbies was made not to control one particular party, but to have control of both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. And by having control of those two parties, whoever came into power, they knew what the public policy and international foreign policy would be. So my question is, how are we as a group mobilizing to ensure that the hundreds of thousands that pe of people that turn up, turn up with the intention of supporting MPs who did not vote for a ceasefire and uh, that they turn up to support MPs that do support a ceasefire and they go back to their constituencies and mobilize in numbers and support those people that way politically because I think we need to be a bit more active on that side. And only when we have the right people in power will we be able to affect change. And I understand that US foreign policy kind of dictates a lot of what we do, but at the same time, if we were to reverse that, it would make a statement. Do you have any comment on that? And does anybody else in the panel have any comment on that, please? Thank you, and I think you had your hand up. Yeah, at the back there. Um. See any other questions? Um, just Sorry. Yep. Okay. Um, this is for. Um, sorry, I'm really bad with names, but the lady um, who talks about uh, speaking to strangers. The, you plugged your husband's book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sorry, I'm really bad with names. Um, I would be very interested in hearing more about kind of what Nick type of negotiation or what you can achieve because I'll be honest I'm somebody who very much like the sister who last spoke I don't believe in power I believe in working outside structures even when the government didn't vote for a ceasefire I, I do a lot of um, social media and I even made a video asking people why were they upset when a government that is formed on racial capitalism and other exploitative models acts exactly how a racial capitalist state is meant to act, which is to prioritize 
well, not prioritise people. So, you know, I would, I am open to hearing um, what you meant because even when you said that, that a type of negotiation could be, could be found, in my head I instantly thought, oh, it's, uh, it's doing some meeting in the middle and kind of giving you something in order for me to gain something. But personally, I'm very tired of playing these silly capitalist games. I'm very much, again, power to the people. I don't believe in government. So I, I just would be open, though, to hearing what you mean. Okay. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, there's a question there at the back, at the very back, and then we will have the answers. No, no, the microphones can... Hi, I just wanted to thank you all for having this panel. I won't keep you long. Um, it's really appreciated by students and I know faculty as well in the current environment at SOAS, which has been really suffocating. Um, as I'm sure most people know, there were students who were suspended uh, just for protesting outside of the main building. And we don't need to recap the whole situation here, but I really encourage anybody who is a student here MA, BA of any kind. We have uh, department statements from anthropology, history of archaeology, art and archaeology, post-colonial studies, uh, development studies. Every single department is working on putting pressure internally to give reps uh, and professors a mandate to be able to push on this issue and to try and return the suspended <coughs> students before Christmas because currently SOAS is violating its own disciplinary policy and is trying to make it so that these students miss their entire first term and don't come back until term two. So. I just hope that we can all keep harnessing this energy. I really support and respect all the work that you are all doing, and uh, we're hoping to push forward to get more BDS and actions and stuff happening at SOAS. And if you're part of a society, we're also all writing statements and submitting them through the SU as formal demands and complaints uh, about how the administration has made this a hostile environment for all students, but especially Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, uh, Asian, uh, non- and anti-Zionist Jewish students and their allies. So. If folks are interested, uh, there's lots of statements that are happening right now and being submitted, so uh, come have a chat if you're curious. There's a link tree with a list of all the statements, and hopefully by next week we can have every single department at SOAS having to talk about this, whether they like it or not. Thank you. Shall we start with Rafif, and then maybe whoever wants to answer, maybe. I wanted to tackle the point about uh, the health sector first. Um, we're actually working on a statement from Palestinian trade unions in the health sector right now to mobilize health sector workers. Um, and I completely share your frustration, and I have relayed them to the organizers of the big marches, is that it's great to have numbers on the streets, but if we're not mobilizing them for action afterwards, it all dissipates and we t take our anger out into the street and we say, great, there are big numbers, but we need to do more with the numbers that are there. Um, and I think that is starting to happen and we're thinking about it. A lot of Palestinian organizations that I work with, Amy work with, um, are trying to do that. In terms of the health sector specifically, um, I think there's a lot of effort to be done within the unions and the rank and file of the unions because there is support. So it's not just about the political parties. It's also in our spaces where we have power. And there are very particular asks from Palestinian medical sector unions about making sure that the borders are open for, for patients to come in and out, that the border is still closed for patients, making sure medication comes in. Every single hospital has been decimated to the ground. So there is real work to be built um, from our medical sector unions here to support the medical sector. This is tangible, real work. Doctors actually going and volunteering, um, fighting to be allowed to enter. Um, there's an urgent need right now. There have been many doctors, medics that have been murdered, and already prior to this, the medical sector was, was suffocated. Um, no concrete, so they're not allowed to build new sections. Um, there's entire equipment that is not allowed in by the Israeli siege. We also need to educate people about what has been happening with the medical sector in Palestine, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. In Gaza, it's in much worse condition, but even in the West Bank, um, there's high shortages of specific, um, specific types of doctors that are needed, shortages of beds. All of this information about the Palestinian medical sector needs to come out, and I think there's a lot for medical unions to do. 
So I think we need to put that out there. The statement will come out by the end of this week. Um, and with it, we're going to provide information about the medical sector. So there's rank and file and education work that needs to happen. All of that, of course, these unions are one sector where we do have power to also lobby. Um, we, lobbying is just not a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the MPs. It's also ensuring that our organizations are strong and are pushing in a specific direction. But for me, it's about building that knowledge and that power and trying to get rank and file organizing happening in the medical sector. There's very good pockets of support, but they're very disorganized and disjointed. Some of the union leadership is very afraid to take action, and we need to push them from the rank and file. And that will only happen if the rank and file actually organizes, pushes notions, makes sure these things happen. So, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave the discussions about lobbying and MPs. Um, I, I don't think it's as simple as we change the MPs and foreign policy will change, but I think that's a much longer discussion that we don't have time for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I may be at the end one comment, because I think it's good if we have comments from everyone. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to follow on, f first of all, from the, the medical uh, side on, uh, because uh, I used to be chief executive of medical aid for Palestinians, and uh, it w the, the importance of really understanding what is happening in terms of the constant attacks on hospitals, both in Gaza and the West Bank, but also stopping patients from being able to access the six main hospitals in East Jerusalem as well is really essential to understanding this long-term effort to ethnically cleanse Palestinians because if you don't have a developed healthcare system people can't stay on the land so I think it's very very important to connect those things uh, and see it in in terms of the deep set structural violence that goes on not just during these escalations of violence in Gaza and when we see it happening in the West Bank but it happens on a regular basis it's routine and it's been happening for decades um, and then just on the issue of the mobilization and um, the impact on politicians we've seen how little impact so far and how devastating it is to see that but it's still so important that everybody continues to go out on the streets and to show that actually there's this enormous gap between what politicians across the political spectrum are saying and the feeling of people in the country. So there are many uh, organizations also who are kind of working in the British Palestinian Committee um, is uh, an advocacy organization which is Palestinians who are from all sorts of different spheres, lawyers, academics, um, health practitioners, who are trying to ensure that Palestinian voices are also central to policy discussions. Nobody at present in the po politically are an address for us to go to, um, given the kinds of statements they have been putting out. But I think it's still very important that we're mobilizing and that we are, are clear that, that there needs to be uh, recognition of Palestinians and Palestinian civil society. And we also have to work very hard to ensure that the boycott, divestment, and uh, sanctions legislation, the anti-boycott uh, legislation that is going through is something that we are, are lobbying very hard on. So there are key issues that we need to address. It's exceptionally hostile at the moment. Um, uh, it's been hostile ever since Balfour, let's face it. But, but essentially, we still have to work on many different tracks. Um, and uh, that won't happen unless there's grassroots mobilization that really shows the strength of feeling across the country. Um, Alison? Have I got time to answer this one? And we have to get thrown out for a film or something, are we? Um, I think we'll be okay. We have time. Okay. Yes. T well, sorry. Um, with regard to the issue about the medical cover, um, the, the two NHS GPs who wrote this briefing for us, Rana and I know that we got nothing back. Nobody, nobody wrote back to us and said, yes, this is horrendous. But this often happens to us. What we feel sure of is that Rana um, measures this, we get about a 35% click rate. So that means that a third of the people in this really insane bubble 
in South Westminster, they are picking up, they are looking at what we're sending them. So part of what we're doing is information. I tend to read The Guardian. Very few people in Parliament, I think, read The Guardian. They might read The Telegraph. Maybe they read The Daily Mail. I don't know what they read, but they don't know what we know. And so part of this is information giving. But it, as I said earlier on, it's also very long haul. The, the, since we issued that briefing, the health situation, has, the, the crisis has become unimaginably worse. So I think probably we should run a panel of experts in the House of Commons. And you know, you, you are, we're, we're talking to people who have been instructed by the whips to vote against a ceasefire. They have been instructed by the whips not to show a predisposition towards peaceful solution at this point. They are committed theoretically to a two-state solution, but that's, that's not what they're practicing. But I don't care. The fact is they don't know much about stuff. And we can actually, you know, we've got evidence. We, we forced a, a vote on me, and actually I'll talk about that later when I respond to your question. Sorry, I should now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Des, perhaps we could bring in the, uh, the, the media element. Oh, I think I've said enough about that. I wanted to echo um, the points made by previous panellists about the need to continue protesting and demonstrating, because I'm a bit more positive. I don't think we should underestimate the impact of these giant mobilisations across the world. I think they have started to change behaviour. They have forced the Welsh Government to adopt a ceasefire policy. They have forced the Scottish Government to adopt a ceasefire policy. They have ravaged the Labour Party. There have been mass resignations. I think Starmer, who's been horrendous on this, is not sitting comfortably as a result of what we have done. They have, che they have forced trade union leaders, and I completely agree it's going to have to come from the rank and file, all change, all pressure for change comes from the rank and file, from the grassroots. And it has had that impact inside the trade unions. The first demonstration, I think there were, there was one Labour MP, sorry, Labour MP, there wasn't Labour, there was one MP who spoke at that first demonstration, who was Jeremy Corbyn, not the Labour MP. There were, I think, two trade union leaders. And as a result of growing and consistent mobilising, some of those trade union leaders and more Labour MPs have shown their faces on these. And that's as a result of our pressure. That makes it easier to get the motions heard, to, to make real, for example, inside UCU, the, the BDS policy, which at the moment is rhetorical. It was passed at Congress. We have to make that actual. Um, and just in terms of continuing with my crazy optimism here, I don't get the same feeling as what you were saying at the end. I don't feel like we just disperse. So I may teach at Goldsmiths, but I live in South Essex. It is not a hotbed of pro-Palestinian militancy. But I can tell you that everyone who goes to the London protests, they still have a home outside London, and they go back, and we are taking action all the time as a result of coming together and being inspired by the mobilizations. So every other week when there's not a national mobilization, there is a local mobilization in South End on Sea. You are all more than welcome to come down this Saturday. And in between those local um, demonstrations, and believe me, 300 people marching down South End High Street is quite big news. Yes. And remember, the mobilizations nationally have put local pro-Palestinian organizing on the map in hundreds of cities in the UK. So there are, as we speak now, at South and Victoria Station, there is a die-in, um, leafleting the people, the commuters coming out. There are regular lobbies of the MPs, uh, the two Tory MPs in the area. We're not going to change their minds, but it's crucial to give confidence to people that, that, that we are demanding that they be accountable. So I would, I would just be encouraging all of us to make sure that we keep going, that these national mobilizations are kind of the backbone of everything else that is happening. We need the school students' walkouts. We need the direct action. We absolutely desperately need rank and file activity. I think all of these coincide together. I have no idea what that has to do with the media. I suspect that they are not going to be that helpful um, in publicizing them, but it is always the other way around. It is our actions making it impossible 
for them to ignore it. The first three demonstrations, the BBC, it was, even I was stunned um, that the BBC never, in their stories on the national demonstrations, they never spoke to anyone who attended the demonstrations. They've changed their behaviour now. Um, the last couple, they have, you hear grassroots voices. The only way that the media is ever going to change is through what we collectively do, not as a result of some kind of edi spontaneous editorial shift. Thank you so much, Des. And maybe just uh, one minute and one minute because we're running out of time. I mean, I don't have to, I don't have to speak. Um, I'm just going to say about the medical community. The medical community holds a lot of power in the UK, and I think nurses, nursing is one of the most trusted professions, so there's a lot of stuff that you could be organising within your GP practice or within your surgery, and you could be making these connections with what's happening in, in Gaza at the moment with um, the hostile environment in the UK, NHS charging the treatment of asylum seekers, migrants. So there's a lot of things that you could be doing, organising in your own particular GP practice or hospital. Um, that's all I have to say. I don't want to waste more time. Thank you. And Gilbert? <clears throat> well, very quickly, um, we, are, we are demanding now a ceasefire. We are putting pressure on, on politicians for the demand of a ceasefire. And well, we, we can hope that uh, the, the, the outcry at the, the, the scale of the, the, the genocide is such that uh, this, uh, this will be progressing. However, uh, indeed, and as uh, Rafiq said, I mean, or, or, or beyond what even Rafiq said, a ceasefire would mean just stopping the situation as it is now. It's a very, very minimal demand. It's just a, a kind of stopgap. What you do after that? Well, we have to think of the slogans for now, for the, 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 the coming period. First, I would say the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of the Israeli army from Gaza. That's the very first point here. And secondly, the, uh, uh, the right of the people there to, to determine their, their fate, not something that is decided in Qatar by the... Uh, uh, chief of Mossad discussing with the chief of the Egyptian security and the chief of CIA. And they are just discussing what kind of scenario, and I was speaking, you know, a lot of uh, talks you will find about scenarios for Gaza in which the Palestinian population as a whole, not, let alone the Palestinian population as a whole, but even the Gazan population are, are, are not part of the picture. So I think we have to be aware of these problems and these will be very much on the agenda for the coming months and probably beyond that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you all. And I think that this is the theme, is that, you know, to think beyond now to the next step, which is, you know, kind of preparing and getting ready uh, with, the, with, with effective language um, that will help uh, shift maybe uh, public opinion. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, the term public opinion and so on. Um, but also, you know, to have events like this. And I think that it matters for people in Gaza that we go on these protests, that we demonstrate, that we show our support, that we are thinking of them, and that we, we do believe that, there are hum that they are humans, and that we believe that the um, Israeli Zionist uh, narrative of dehumanizing the Palestinians will have to fail. Thank you.